All right, guys, welcome to Question of Strength, essentially my window into YouTube where I talk about trading, either my own or answer your questions, as well as talk about topics that do interest me. Like, for example, uh, there's one piece of information I recently learned that kind of made me change some of my views about training. Uh, obviously, I'm constantly in, in, evolving when it comes to trying to learn new methods uh, or new ways of, of building muscle or Perform, improving performance or improving body composition. And I've always been a guy who favored uh, a fairly high training frequency per muscle. Uh, that comes from my uh, background as an Olympic weightlifter. And even when I was training for football, uh, our strength coach did have us like squat three days a week. Um, so I've always trained the big basic lift fairly often. Uh, when I was Olympic weightlifting, obviously we would clean and jerk and snatch and squat pretty much every day. Uh, so when I transitioned into more of a bodybuilding-ish body composition approach, I kind of kept those principles, not all the time, not with all programs, but, but in my toolbox, certainly. Uh, I've written articles about the importance of frequency, and I still believe that to some extent. However, I now believe that, well, now believe that, the studies have actually made me believe that extreme frequency when it comes to hypertrophy and like performance would be a different a different story. Um, but for hypertrophy, it might not be such a great idea. Uh, the reason is that if you have a, a second stimulation too close to the first one, so there's not, you do a workout, let's say for your chest, then you do a second workout for your chest, let's say 48 hours later. Uh, that might actually decrease the anabolic response from that second workout. Uh, in other words, the amount of protein synthesis increased in response to that second workout is somewhat dependent on the time between both stimulus or stimuli. So, so for example, the, the, the amount of protein synthesis that is triggered, and, and that is actually responsible for muscle growth, that is triggered from that second session uh, will be much higher if you have 72 hours between stimulation for the same muscle. That doesn't necessarily mean 72 hours between workouts. It means 72 hours before hitting a muscle again. So I still believe that hitting a muscle more often than traditional, which is once a week, it is better. But it's probably more in line with like two stimulation per muscle per week, something like that. Uh, that's a, a small piece of information that I found Pretty interesting. Now, I mentioned that for strength development or performance, it might not be the same thing. The reason is when we're training, for example, for strength, especially in phases where we favor neurological or neuromuscular adaptations, we don't rely as much on muscle growth per se to maximize gains. And it's not like you're not going to get gains if you have less than 72 hours. It's just a small amount of protein synthesis, but, but you're still progressing. But if you are training for strength and you want to maximize neuromuscular factors, then there's something to be said about increasing the frequency of, of practicing each movement or certainly in each muscle. The reason is that the more often you do an exercise, you be obviously become more efficient at it. If you're a powerlifter, if you practice your squat more often, you will become better at squatting, obviously provided that you're practicing with good form, okay? And you also become more efficient uh, in that it will require less neural drive to activate the muscles involved in the squat. That's been shown in, in, in some studies, and I like to, I hate to say that because I'm not quoting the study and not giving you the reference, but I, I've actually used it in some of my, some of my presentations. Uh, what happens is that at the synaptic level, the synapses are where like the nerve connects to the muscle, to the muscular neuromuscular junction, and that's where the signal to fire the muscle gets through the muscle, right? Uh, and by practicing a movement more often or training a muscle more often, you actually improve the synapses capacity to trigger the muscle activation. And over, turn, over time, it might actually be possible to increase the number of synapses in that muscle, making it even harder, uh, even easier to recruit uh, the muscle and make it fire and produce tension. The cool thing is that as you are improving synaptic capacity, you need less and less and less neural drive to get the same result. So that's one of the reasons why, for example, weightlifters, Olympic weightlifters can squat 
five days a week, six days a week, and, and you can't. The reason is they are so efficient at a synaptic level that the neurological cost of a squat or a snatch or a clean and jerk for them is probably no higher than a curl for you. So that would be something that is uh, interesting to differentiate between performance and hypertrophy. When I train athletes, I still use three whole body workouts a week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, typically using either a different type of contraction on each workout, like eccentric focus, statodynamical isometric focus, and regular concentric focus or explosive focus. Or I might use a second approach, which would focus more on physical capacities. For example, Monday could be strength. Wednesday could be speed strength and Friday could be strength speed, for example, okay, depending on what the athlete need, obviously. So, so what is optimal for hypertrophy might not be the best for performance and vice versa, right? Uh, by the way, I want to mention that I, I just released a, a series of new programs on testosterone nation. They are exclusive to testosterone nation. Uh, it's basically uh, three, six weeks training phases or training blocks which can either be used as a standalone, for example, because each of these three blocks use a different ideology. There is a load-based program, which is about increasing the load gradually throughout the program. There is uh, to stimulate growth. So that would be more of a power building program, right? So you can expect both size and an equal amount of strength gain and barbell lift performance on, on that program. Then there is the volume-based phase, which is all about gradually increasing volume throughout the training cycle. And that is your mean of progression. That is the way that you keep adapting and creating gains. Because the more often you repeat the same training stimulus, the less responsive you become to it. So that's why you most, okay, the two main reasons why people fail to progress at least past the first few weeks or the first few months of their training is first, they, they don't train hard enough, okay? And that is regardless of their training ideology, they just don't push their work sets hard enough. I'm not saying that you need to go to failure, only effort-based training requires that. But even if you have a volume approach, you still need to train hard enough for the set to have an effect. So stopping like four reps short of failure is gonna provide very little, if any, hypertrophy stimulus, regardless of the number of sets like that you do, right? And the second reason why people fail to progress is that they don't have a, a programmed or at least a somewhat structured progression model, like a way to gradually increase the training stress over the course of a training cycle and from cycle to cycle to keep the body from being too much adapted too well adapted to a certain stimulus. So you need to gradually increase the stimulus without exceeding it so much that you will uh, go past your body capacity uh, to recover and handle physical stress, okay? So the volume would be would do that by increasing volume gradually, where the effort-based program, which would be a lower volume, higher effort, so to failure or sometimes beyond, accomplish that progression by week to week, switching to a more... Um, I want to say intense, if you want to call it that, uh, method for that work set. So we might go, for example, from going to failure to using a rest pause, and there's a gradual progression for the six-week cycle. So you certainly can decide to pick one ideology that better fits your, your, your psychological profile because you can get equal gains with all three approaches. And that's something that the internet doesn't tell you because if you go on social media, obviously polarization is what sells. So if you have someone who's a proponent of a certain type of training, let's say volume-based uh, or, or effort-based, that then in an, an attempt to make more money or, or, more, or, or gain more popularity or more followers, whatever, you need to be as polarizing as possible, making it sound like your way of doing things is the only one that works, that the only one that is supported by science and that is logical. And you, by the way, that that's the way to do that is to kind of make fun or ridicule or argue against methodologies that go that are different than yours, right? The, the, the reality is that people have been building muscle and strength using all three approaches. They can work equally well, provided they are well programmed and used by the right person at the right time, right? So you can either decide to pick one ideology and repeat the cycle or maybe use different exercises and make that into a 12, 18 week cycle if you want. Or you can combine all three programs into a training cycle. In which case, the way I like to do it is that depends on your level. 
if you are a beginner. Now, for example, the three programs I, I have, one is effort-based, one is volume-based, one is load-based. So if you are more of a beginner, I recommend starting with the volume-based program. The reason is that volume will build more motor skill, more a bigger foundation of work capacity, and better practice in contracting your muscles and practice in doing the exercises. Uh, so it, oftentimes beginners lack that. They lack neurological efficiency, they lack motor control, and they lack muscle control. And, and they don't know the exercises. So higher volume of work is probably going to be beneficial for them at that point. Uh, then they would switch to a, a, an effort-based program, which will teach them how to train hard. Because that's one people that's one thing that people rarely learn. They learn how to follow sets and reps, how to do tempo, but very few people actually teach them what it is to train hard. Now, you don't always have to train to failure, but training for to failure for a certain period of time certainly teaches you what it is to train hard. It's much easier to scale down somewhat from that point than trying to go up to the right level when you don't know where the ceiling is. Make sense? It also makes it much easier to know how many reps in reserve you have. Because if you go six weeks to failure, you kind of know what one rep short of failure feels like, two reps short of failure feels like. Most people who think they are stopping two reps short of failure really are stopping, stopping like four reps short of failure, making the set kind of ineffective. Okay, And then it would finish by uh, with a load-based program, which has some benefits in far as the look you get. It's going to improve muscle density. It increases muscle tone. It also dramatically increases the strength of the nervous system. So when you start a new cycle, it actually you're starting from a much more effective base. Okay. Now, if you're more of an intermediate or advanced lifter, I would actually start with the effort-based program because you've been probably doing volume. You, you already have a foundation of work capacity. You already know the movement. You already have good technique. You're already decent at contracting your muscles. What you need is to make sure that you know how to train hard. So by doing that phase, not only are you getting gains, you're actually in, ingraining or developing a skill, the skill of training hard. And then when we switch to the volume block, which is the second block, that then you will be able to train at the proper level of effort, even though it's not failure, because you can better evaluate proximity to failure, and then you would finish with the low base program. So they are available on testosteronenation.com. You go on the store, and then you, you go on the, 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 the shop thing, and it's in the, um, uh, the plan category. All right. So that was my publicity for the day, but I, I'm really proud of those programs. They are extremely easy to read, even though it's a complex, some are complex, but they're easy to read because of the great job that the editors at Testosterone Nation did. Uh, so certainly check them out. Even if you don't want to follow all of them, it's kind of fun to know, be able to put into quote unquote words or image what my concept actually looks like. All right, let's get to some of your questions. I already have some good questions in the chat room. By the way, at any point, you can always post questions in the chat room. I recommend posting them sooner than later because typically I have like uh, uh, between 45 minutes, I can bleed into an hour. Uh, so if you wait for too long to post your question, you post it at the 42 minutes mark, chances are I might not get to your question depending on where I am in my list. All right, first question. I talked to a CrossFit coach. They talked about layering volume so that they can handle the training volume. Okay, what do you mean by layering volume? Do you bring some more info on this? Ex example, a hockey player being able to play all three quarters. Uh, periods, not quarters. A quarter means that you have four periods. So it's, a, it's two periods. Um, so I, I honestly don't really understand your question about layering volume. What do you mean about layering volume? I mean, I, I'm not being an, uh, an ass. J just try to like, explain to me and write it down in a new question. I mean, do you mean like spreading the volume over several sessions in the day? For example, they might do, let's say, skill work in the morning, and they might do strength work a few hours later, and then conditioning work in the evening, uh, because I don't exactly know what you mean by layering volume. So I would appreciate uh, more precision so I can give you a better answer. All right. CD, is the layout for the low volume program? I don't, by the way, just, okay, and I'm not being pedantic. I don't like the term low volume training to define effort-based training, okay? Uh, the reason is that the, and again, that's something that even like the old 
HIT or HIT proponent uh, were using as one of their principles. It's low volume, it's low frequency, it's high effort, right? Uh, but the more modern, more scientific based uh, effort based training is not, the low volume is not a principle. Okay, you don't have to do low volume. The reason why effort based programs are lower in volume is because the core principle uh, of effort based training is milking every single work set for everything it can give you. Okay, and because you're getting a lot more from a set, you don't need as many sets to get to the same result. Okay, that's the main reason why you have lower volume. Also, the fact that you are pushing those work sets so hard means that you just from a recovery standpoint and just from a maintaining a focus, performance, neurological drive standpoint, you just cannot do as much volume. So really the volume amount is mostly a side effect of the type of training, which is milking every set, every work set, for everything you have. Just a precision. I'm not being a, 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 an ass here. Just just want to make sure that we talk the same language. The low volume surge okay. is the layout for the low volume program similar to your high program, optimal strength training for natural athletes. Uh, optimal strength training for natural athlete is a testosterone nation program, by the way. Um, no, it's not remotely similar to that. Uh, it's really more of um, in line. And again, if I could give you an example, although it's not like that, it's based on the it, the look is fairly similar to to how Dorian Yates used to train, okay, uh, and somewhat similar to how Prime Manager used to train. Not the heavy uh, duty, which is in my opinion ineffective. That's just not enough work. Uh, but no, it's it's not like uh, the low the 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 optimal strength training for natural athlete. Although the assistance work for that program is somewhat similar in that it's lower volume, higher effort, okay. Coach, after a competition or could a completion of a T Nation program, do you repeat the program or you, can you cycle to different training programs and go back to original program? Uh, I kind of just address that. I mean, you're probably talking about, uh, are you talking about the program I just put out? I have three phases program, in which case, I mean, as I mentioned, you can cycle through the program. Uh, you can start, if you're intermediate, you start with the, the effort-based program, then you switch to volume-based program, then to the low-based program, which would give you an 18 weeks training cycle, okay? Or if you are talking more in a general sense, okay? Uh, yeah, you could go from, a, like you just read an article on T-Nation, there's a program involved, I want to do that program, then four weeks later, you want to switch it to a different one. Yes, that's doable, okay? That's doable. But one thing you need to understand are the specific effects and benefits of a training program. So that sometimes going from one to the next might not be a nice combination. Uh, so for example, if you're doing a program that is very high in conditioning work, then switching to a high volume bodybuilding program might not be the best thing to do from a recovery standpoint, okay? Uh, also, are the programs conducive to getting your goals? Also evaluate the stress, you need to evaluate the stress level of a program. If you go from a program that has a very high level of stimulus, the way it's built, okay, and you switch to a program which is actually a bit less stimulatory than the first one, which can happen if we are talking about programs that are not designed to go with each other. So if you switch to a program with a lower training stimulus, then you might not progress as well. Even though it's a different stimulus, the fact that it's less demanding from an adaptation standpoint, you won't get results. So yeah, you can switch from one program to the other, but you must make sure that from a recovery standpoint, you don't spend too much training with a super high volume of work or, or, or super heavy work. You need balance things out. But more importantly, you must make sure that a new program is actually a step up, not just a lateral step or downward step compared to the first program. Uh, the, the, the cool thing with uh, the, um, the, the three programs I designed for T-Nation is that I actually designed them with that in mind of doing them one after the other, even though you can repeat the program. Now, that's the first part of your question. Can you repeat the program? Yes, you can. But you would need to either start from a slightly higher point either load wise or maybe a bit more volume, because if you just repeat the program, you're going back to the same level of training stimulus you had for the first cycle. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a need if you want continuous progression to gradually step up the training stimulus. 
obviously you can't do that forever. So you will need periods of maintenance or resensitization or recovery. Okay. But if we're talking about hard training, they need to be a progression in the stimulus. So repeating a same program does not include that. So you could switch to different exercises, which might help a bit. You might add a bit of volume, or if you repeat the same program, make sure at least you're, you're using uh, more weight. All right. I'm type 2A. Do I need to switch different programs and ideology? You don't need to, but you are neurologically capable of doing it. All right, Christian. If doing an isometric hold at the bottom of a lift, let's say a squat, do you think it's better to hold the stretch at the exact in the full bottom position or slightly above the bottom position with an active contraction? Well, first, you, regardless of where you are doing the isometric hold, it needs to be an active contraction, okay? Because the, the, the again, okay, let me rephrase that. If your goal is to build muscle, okay, you need to keep the muscle tensed or, or contracting when you are holding that isometric hold. In the, in the lengthened position, the goal is to put a muscle under stretch while it's being loaded or, or under tension. That's tensed stretching. If the muscle is completely relaxed, yes, it's very good or it can be good for mobility improvement or for extensibility improvement, uh, maybe for tendon strengthening, uh, but it won't be as effective from a hypertrophy standpoint. Okay, uh, you need to read. So, so my, if you can maintain the very low position while still having tension in your quadriceps, for example, in a squat, uh, that, then do the pause there. If you are so mobile that you're actually sitting on your ankle, reducing the tension in the quads a lot, then that would be too low for our purpose. Same thing if you do a bench press. If you do a bench press, well, holding the pause in the low position won't be really effective because the bar will be touching on your chest, underloading the muscles. However, if you're doing the press, the bench press on with dumbbells, then I would recommend going as low as you can because the movement will be loaded, okay? So, so the principle to remember is if your goal is hypertrophy and you want to benefit from that, that, that hole at the bottom, you want that load to be performed while the muscle is under tension. If it's relaxed or even just partially tense, then you are losing the effectiveness. Now, there are other reasons to do a pause at the bottom of a lift, which is unrelated to hypertrophy. So, so my answer can, can change depending on, on what your goal is. If your goal is uh, strength, if, I mean, let's say I'm working with a part lifter or an athlete who wants to increase his lift, then the reason why I'm gonna be using a pause at the bottom is to get rid of the stretch reflex, okay? In that case, in a sense that the stretch reflex, depending on how efficient you are at using it, can contribute for between 20 and 40% of the strength production in the bottom part of the lift. Uh, that obviously helps you lift more weight, but it also reduces the amount of muscle contraction you have to produce to get the weight moving. Now, if I'm working with someone who is weak in the bottom, um, I, want to make, I want to increase the amount of physical work they need to produce in the bottom well, in their training to strengthen that major motion. So I want to get rid of the stretch reflex. That requires a pause of two to three seconds to, to completely negate the stretch reflex. And in that case, I would actually recommend uh, going to the low position you would reach in your competition lift. So to make it as specific as possible to strengthen that, 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 that strong position. So on the bench press, if you're part of it, it might be on the chest. So pausing on the chest, but keeping the upper back tight. Um, on the squat, it would be full squat without losing posture, of course. And the deadlift, well, the deadlift would be like from like some literally like half an inch from the floor. Okay. Uh, so you want it to be as specific as possible to the bottom portion of your lift. So you need you develop the capacity to overcome resistance to muscle through muscle tension rather than the stretch reflex. That would be another reason to use a, a pause in the bottom. Okay. So, so my answer would might be slightly different depending on the goal.
All right, you guys need more questions because I'm going to be short, unless I'm going to be talking for hours with one question. So don't hesitate to write your questions. The more good questions I have, the more interesting it's going to be. Okay, new one, that's cool. Uh, what are your favorite top three exercises for developing explosive power in the legs for change of direction and acceleration? There is no three exercises that do all of that because we're literally describing three different things. Okay, explosive power, for it, it's a foundational capacity. Uh, so maximum power is not displayed in change of direction. There's certainly power in change of direction, but it's more like quickness. You never reach the maximum amount of power production you can. So that maximum power is not required for change of direction. There are other things involved, like the stretch reflex, the capacity to absorb force, so it would be more eccentric and concentric related. Uh, and acceleration would also have technical uh, elements. But, but, so, so let's talk about first developing power. Okay, developing power as a broad physical capacity for the lower body. Uh, in my and again, the, the, see it this way: uh, the improving maximum power will give you the foundation to become better at changing direction and accelerating. But you need to practice drills to improve change of direction and drills to improve acceleration to be able to take the power you, you built and apply it in those movements. Okay, so so that's that's why it's it's two different things. Okay, uh, so for for maximum power, and that there is no three best exercises for there never is uh, because it depends on the person. I mean, if I'm working with someone who has zero experience with explosive work, okay? Either he's a, it's a beginner to training or someone who's been training mostly just for strength or maybe a hypertrophy, but never actually doing any explosive work outside of sports, the, the sports they're playing, then I, I can't get them using something like loaded jumps, which I really like for power development, like using 20 to 30% of your maximum and jumping as high as you can, either with a trap bar, with dumbbells, with a barbell on your back, um, several options. Uh, but if you have no experience doing jumps in training, then I would certainly not do that exercise because it's going to be a way, way too high of a stimulus for, for what you're after. Furthermore, power development, okay? Power, and that's a complex topic in itself. Power development is dependent on many factors. And you might not have the same weakness as some other. So maybe your problem with power production is you lack the neural drive to activate those fast switch fibers to create that fat, the, the, the powerful movement. That's where strength work, good old strength work, like heavy squats, might actually be more beneficial than actually explosive work. Because if, you're, if what you lack is the signal, then you need to use what will build that strong signal to start with. So people with zero, with very poor neurological capacities will increase speed of movement just by doing strength work, which is not the case for people who are already strong. Doing more strength work will not make them faster. It can actually make them slower. Okay, So that's one thing to consider. Now, also, is power production... Um, uh, is the muscle, is the uh, elasticity, the stretch reflex, what is your lack problem? So that, the best exercise really depends on what you need to work on. But in a general sense, if we're talking about someone with experience in explosive work, loaded jumps uh, would be my number one power builder. Uh, I like the power variation of the Olympic lifts from the hang. So power snatch from the hang most of the time. I, I'm, I prefer the power snatch over the power clean, because what I find with strong athletes like football players, they can muscle up the clean, whereas the, the snatch is kind of hard to do. So uh, uh, um, power snatch from the hang. Uh, it can be also from a, a lower body perspective, uh, prowler sprints, for example, Okay, like using a load that is between, let's say, 20 to 50% of your body weight, uh, either pushing a prowler or pulling a sled, both work. And that would be done for short distances. Uh, loaded sprints are very effective as a power developer and to improve the acceleration phase of a sprint. Okay, so up to like 20, maybe 30 meters, there are benefits to using loaded sprints. Higher than that, 
Like if you do if you do loaded sprints of 60 meters, that's actually gonna hurt your speed. Because the, the reason is when you do loaded sprints, either on the prowler or putting a sled, it favors a more like horizontal body position with your with your hips and your feet behind you and more of a more like this position. Whereas if when you reach the top speed position, let's say you reach your top speed after that, well, no, you, you did your acceleration phase the first 30 meters. After that, you gradually raise your upper body. So at the end of a sprint, like the last phase of a sprint, you're like, you're like this, which is the opposite. When you do slads or product work, it actually helps you be like this. You exaggerate that position, which will be specific to the acceleration phase, but counter specific to the speed phase. So that would be a good acceleration drill. And that's what you asked for. As far as um, agility, change of direction is concerned, uh, you need to pinpoint what the problem is. Okay, Is it eccentric strength? Is it isometric strength? Is it concentric strength? Because for, when you're changing direction, the first thing you need to do is absorb the weight and force of your body, stop its progression to, so that you can change direction, right? So if you lack eccentric strength, Instead of stopping abruptly, you will need a longer absorption phase. I'm exaggerating, right? And it gets you out of position to properly pr produce the other movement. And also, it obviously delays the change of direction. So you need to be strong eccentrically. That could be done through absorption drills, like standing on the box and then landing. Standing on the box laterally, up and down and landing. Absorbing force, for example. Uh, or, or working on eccentric strength with your lift, okay? Uh, it also requires a lot of core strength and upper body strength so that you don't do this. And that would shift more momentum and you need to change direction. So you need to be able, the core needs to be solid. So that it's just a, a block who's moving. Uh, if you lack isometric strength okay, in key positions, when you hit, you absorb force, you're fine. But there will be a delay until you can switch from absorption to projection. So, so you will need to be strong, isometrically strong, in the lowest or the most extreme positions you will reach. So for example, you could film yourself when you're changing direction, then you copy that position and you hold it for let's say 30 seconds and have a slight load to work on isometric strength in that key position. And if it's concentric, then it's super easy to fix because if you're capable of absorbing and stopping and reversing direction, all you need to do is just push harder. So you do any jumping drill, lateral drill will, will work, okay? But most people, the problem with the reason why they lack uh, agility is lack of eccentric or isometric strength, especially in key positions. And the heavier you get, the more problematic that becomes. Layering volume in CrossFit context. Under program theory of macro cycle, the coach talked about layering volume as a secret methodology, but maybe in, that doesn't make sense. I, I don't understand the words you're typing. I'm not trying to be an ass. I just don't understand what you mean by layering. Is that uh, you have blocks where you have higher volume of work, and then you have blocks where there's lower volume of work? I don't know. To me, layering, layering for me, it's doing a layer of let's say strength work layer with power work and whatever on the same exercise so I, I'm, I really can't help you because i don't understand what you're saying all right uh where would you program 10 to 12 weeks of conditioning that's too long uh when your cycle effort base volume and power building volume to effort to power to conditioning okay first i would not use 10 to 12 weeks of conditioning, it makes zero sense, both from a recovery standpoint and uh, from an overall gain standpoint. You're typing this question because you talked about effort base and volume base and power building. So I assume that one of your main goals is to build muscle and get stronger. So doing a 10 to 12 week block shot focused on conditioning uh, will certainly be uh, let's say counterproductive for those goals okay second conditioning is what actually improves the fastest uh, if you compare it to muscle growth to strength um to other physical capacity speed conditioning is very easy to improve and improves very fast so there is really no need for 10 to 12 weeks of conditioning work uh like three especially if you keep some conditioning work in your programming in the other phases uh you need like 
four weeks, maybe six weeks tops to get like in true, very, very, very good condition. Uh, especially again, if you've been doing conditioning to some moderate or, or small amount in the other phases. Um, so where would you put it? Uh, it depends on again, okay. I'm going to try to make it this, it, it, it's an individual thing. There is no, for example, let me just say, for, in theory, if you look at the periodization theory, the hypertrophy phase should be done before the strain phase, which should be done before the power phase or the specific phase, right? Uh, but many studies have demonstrated that for muscle, when muscle growth is concerned, doing strength work prior to hypertrophy work leads to better results in hypertrophy. So in that case, doing the strength work, the strength block before hypertrophy block would be more effective. Uh, so I can't give you a universal answer of where you need to put it. Now, of course, it would depend first on, okay, when you're programming with a long-term, we'll say, context, you need to first truly be objective about yourself. First, assess what is your end game. Let's say you're planning a six months of training. What do you want to accomplish after that six months period? What is the ultimate you you want to achieve after those six months where you invest in your training? Then you need to objectively assess where you are right now. And that means what you need to go from here to here. Okay, what capacities do I need to train? Which ones are more uh, in the deficit than others? Uh, I, I, for let's say that the person you want to be here has X level of strength, X level of condition, and Y amount of conditioning, and Z amount of, of muscle mass, okay, and power, whatever. You can throw away whatever you want, depending on what you want. Now assess yourself. How much strength do I need to gain? How much conditioning do I need to improve? How much muscle do I need to gain? And then you say, okay, which one am I the furthest away from my goal? And then that allows you to decide which one will be prioritized and which one will be done first. So it's kind of hard to understand, to, to explain and give you a precise answer. Now, my gut feeling would be to put conditioning first because it's better to develop it and that's going to become super easy to maintain it by only adding like one conditioning based session in your training programs during the other phases. Then just trying to bring it up slightly during one session a week, then doing a block at the end. So my, my gut feeling is they start with conditioning anyway. It will improve also work capacity, which will translate to the other phases. But 10 to 12 weeks is, in my opinion, way too long. All right, coach, I, I, I saw a rare video of Ellen Maroulis. I have no idea who that is. I'm assuming she's a, either a powerlifter or a CrossFit athlete or weightlifter. She was doing three different angles of hyper extension using the Atlantis machine. What's the benefit of doing different angles of extension to be strong in various key positions? Uh, depending on the angle you're using, you will have a different resistance profile. So some angles will put more tension at certain joint angle, at a certain angle or a certain part of the muscles range of motion. Uh, so uh, using more angles allow you to more fully develop the muscle, if you want to call it that. Also strengthen the key position better by overloading each key position range of motion. Will extending time under tension of a rep lead to more muscle hypertrophy? Not necessarily. How many seconds should my eccentric part of the rep last? And what's the optimal, there's no such thing, time under tension range for one set? That doesn't exist. Range of, okay. Time under tension used to be this big concept uh, promoted mostly by Charles Polykin to promote his, his tempo system. And to be fair, he honestly believed that there was some truth to it. And from, um, let's say, energy systems perspective, there is. Meaning that if you want to develop, let's say, the ATP, CP, or phosphagen energy system, then sets lasting, let's say, less than 15 seconds, or certainly less than 20 seconds, are ideal. If you want to develop the glycolytic, the glycolytic, a lactic, so no lactic acid energy system, then you would do sets lasting, let's say, less than 30 seconds, or between, let's say, 20 and 30 or 20 and 40 seconds. If you wanted to develop the glycolytic lactic system, you would do work lasting between, let's say, 40-ish seconds to 90 seconds. If you want to switch to 
you get, you get my drift, okay? So, so from an energy standpoint or system standpoint, there is some logic in there. For hypertrophy, not so much. Not when you understand the, the what actually creates muscle. It's, it's all about tension. And so what you need to get effective hypertrophy is a number of effective repetition in your set. Repetition that do contribute to stimulating growth, okay? Uh, to reach those reps, you need two main conditions. The first condition is recruiting the fast switch fibers because they are, most, they are the most growth prone. Now, when you do a normal set, then the body res you, you recruit muscle fibers according to the size principle. When the, when the effort level required is easy, you only recruit the slow twitch fiber. When the effort level required for your rep is moderate, then you will recruit intermediate fibers. And when the effort level required to move the weight is very high, you will recruit uh, the fast twitch fibers. If you use heavy weights, the effort right from the start is, is high. So you recruit the fast twitch fibers right from the start. If you are using more moderate loads, let's say 70, 80 ish percent weights or 60 to 80 percent weights, the first few reps are quote unquote easy. They don't require lots of effort. You're not bringing the fast switch fibers yet. It only comes as you get fatigue from the set, peripheral fatigue in the muscles that makes you weaker from rep to rep, like 3 percent weaker per rep. So at the end of a set, those reps, even though the weight is light, it's still requiring a high level of effort. Now you need the fast switch fibers, right? So that's the first condition. It's not enough to create growth. Because otherwise, explosive work like jumps and throws will build muscle, but they don't. Okay. Second condition, you need a high amount of tension in those fibers. Okay. So, so tension is somewhat uh, let's say invertly related to speed of movement. The faster you go, the less tension you produce. That's because when you go fast, the body releases the uh, actin myosin bridges to allow for the speed. There's also momentum created, so there's a lot less tension. The slower you go, the more tension there is. That doesn't mean you need to go slow on purpose because that will reduce the fast switch recruitment. But for a set to be effective for growth, okay, or a rep to be effective for growth, you need to reach a point in your set where your repetitions are getting slower and slower and slower, even though you're pushing as hard as you can. It makes sense. So in a normal set, that would be your last four to six reps. Okay. Uh, that is what is needed for growth. Okay. So time under tension does not factor into that because time under tension. Okay. Let's say you, you, you use time under tension can be increased by, by, let's say two different ways. It can either be done by doing more reps. Let's say instead of doing eight reps, you do 15. So you're going to be under tension for longer. But if you understand the maximally effective reps theory, only the last four to six reps, let's say the last five reps of a set will be effective for growth, regardless of the total number of reps you're doing. And when I say the last five reps is provided you train to failure. If you stop one rep short of failure, then you have four effective reps. If you stop two reps short, you have three effective reps. You get my drift. But the point is, if you have the same effort level, regardless of if you do 15 or, or eight reps or six reps, you're going to have five of those reps that are being effective. So increasing the duration of the set by adding reps or the time or the tension will not lead to more muscle growth. So right from the start, it kind of tells you that time or the tension itself doesn't mean shit. Because if time or the tension was important for growth, then there would be benefit in doing higher reps for hypertrophy, and there isn't. Okay. Now, you can also increase time or the tension by doing slower reps. Okay. Uh, the slower reps can be done either by lengthening or the, the duration of the eccentric or the concentric phase or adding a pause. So increasing the duration of the eccentric will be beneficial to a point, okay? Uh, because yes, the, the difference between eccentric and concentric is that during the eccentric, even if you go slow on purpose, okay, you don't reduce fast switch recruitment. So if you go slow on purpose during the concentric, you recruit less fast switch fibers. So, so that makes them less effective. But going increasing the duration of the eccentric phase, yes, it can be beneficial for hypertrophy because you get the added amount of, of mechanical work or the time spent under doing mechanical work for the fibers without reducing fast switch fibers recruitment. Okay. Uh, now, 
The problem is that it can actually become excessive because if you do too short, too long of a phase, you create so much fatigue that it will negatively impact your capacity to perform the concentric, reducing the training stimulus. So yeah, there is a benefit to doing a slightly slow eccentric uh, for hypertrophy, but but super slow eccentric would not be necessarily better. Okay, uh, so I, I don't look at time under tension when programming. So I, I certainly cannot tell you what is the optimal time under tension because that doesn't exist. When I do a set for maximum muscular hypertrophy, should the muscles always be under tension throughout the whole set or should I lock out the joint? It, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you do a normal set, a normal set, that will, the, the main driver of hypertrophy is mechanical tension. Uh, and even if you have points in the range of motion where there's no tension, like you're locking out, okay, that doesn't change how much tension there is when you're doing your reps. So it doesn't make your reps less effective and doesn't make the set less effective. And if it allows you to perform better by resting shortly, it will actually be more effective for hypertrophy. The only way or the only reason or the only application that would make keeping tension constant in the muscle was, would be if you're shooting for using uh, metabolic factors to trigger hypertrophy. Like, Mechanical factor, the tension produced by the muscle is the main driver for hypertrophy. There is a secondary mechanism which is weaker but can still contribute, which is called metabolic factors. Metabolic factors are what? It's growth factors, hormones released by inside the muscle you're training in response to the stimulus. And that stimulus is an accumulation of lactate hydrogen ions that triggers the release of those growth factors. So in that sense, doing for example reps where the muscle is constantly under tension when the muscle is contracting is never relaxing it compresses the capillaries that bring blood in or out of the muscle so the lactate cannot get trapped in the muscle and oxygen cannot come in these two conditions will lead to more growth factors so that naturally makes it more effective but that would be for light work and in a zone shooting for maximum lactate production if you've been listening to my previous answer to your question, uh, that would be set roughly like 40 to 70 seconds in duration where you produce the most lactic acid or most lactate, sorry. Okay, and that for growth factor, that's effective. But understand that growth factors are a very secondary stimulus to mechanical tension. Okay, they are much less effective. The way I can explain it to you is if you want to make a plant grow, you need a fertile soil, okay? If you add fertilizer to the fertile soil, the plant grow faster. But if you put the plant only in fertilizer, no fertile soil, it will not grow. That's what growth factors are. The soil, the fertile soil is the mechanical tension. The, fertile, the, 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 the fertilizer is the growth factor training. So for example, doing your hypertrophy work, which would be focused on mechanical tension, so going to failure or close to it, one rep to short of failure is fine. Uh, gradually thinking about increasing load, et cetera, et cetera, would be your main driver of hypertrophy, like a control but not super slow eccentric. Um, and once that's done, you can finish a workout for a muscle with one exercise done with a growth factor style, which would be constant tension, sets lasting 40 to 70 seconds, uh, maybe one or two sets like that. It will never be as effective by itself as mechanical tension, but when added at the end, when the, the most of the stimulus has already been imposed on the fibers, you can get the hormones that will magnify the response. All right. Uh, what's your opinion on doing a seated hamstring curl versus Nordic curls? Okay, first of all, Nordic curls is not doable by most. Okay, few people can actually go all the way down and bring themselves back up. In fact, most people just can't like even lower themselves halfway down and bring themselves back up. So realistically speaking, you're only training the eccentric action, which is literally one third of the growth stimulus. Whereas the seated hamstring curl allow you to, well, do the full reps. So that will always be more effective than Nordic curls. Nordic curls are to me more of something that an athlete who tends to pull hamstrings would do to as a more of a protective exercise or as something to train for deceleration. Uh, again. 
if you can do like four reps on Nordic Coast, by all means, that's going to be good. But it's still less effective strictly for hypertrophy because it's a less stable movement and requires a lot more neural drive just to stabilize the body. Second, can I do lightweight seated hamstring curls for injury prevention, just like bend and face pulls? Yeah, that's something I've used with a football player. I, I didn't use a seated leg curl, although it can be used. I used banded leg curls because at the time we didn't have the seated leg curl machine and he was traveling a lot. So he, he had a tendency to uh, get hamstring pulls. He was a football player. Uh, so what we did was every day he would do sets of 50 reps on, on leg curls. Uh, so he would try to total something like 200 to, to 300 reps throughout the day, not in one session. Uh, it was an every day to a low level of, of effort, not anywhere close to failure. And that really helped him uh, avoid injuries in his hamstrings. In fact, I don't remember him having any hamstring injuries after that point. How, is import how important is it to switch program or exercises? I seem to do best when I stick to the same things for a long time, but many programs seem to change things a lot. Yeah, um, okay, changing the exercises is not required at all. Uh, I pretty much always do the same exercise. When I, when I work with an athlete, we never we very rarely change the exercises. I find that changing the exercises can actually have more drawbacks than, than positives. The only reason why we would change exercises is that you just can no longer progress on them, even if you try super hard, right? However, you do need to include some form of change in a way of progression. Okay, uh, to keep the training effective, you need to gradually increase the training stimulus because, as I explained earlier in the, in the podcast, uh, the more often you repeat the same level of stimulus, the less effective it becomes at, at stimulating adaptations. That's because you become, with each time you repeat it, you become a bit more adapted to it. So after you've been doing it for 10, 10 20 times, there is almost no response because your body is well adapted to that. Now, there are, so you need to find a way to make that training more demanding or having a higher uh, stimulus level. That can simply be done by adding weight to your exercises, progressive overload, because that increases the strength of the stimulus. But if you can no longer add weight in an exercise, you need to find another progression model. Could be increasing the number of sets, could be using intensifiers. Just find ways of adding training stress. You can do that absolutely without changing programs. You just change some element in your program or changing exercises i don't i rarely change exercises but i the way the key is in a 12-week cycle you need to have some form of progression then you have a phase of maintenance to resensitize your body to the stimulus then you ramp up you ramp up again so the, the key thing is not so much change it's it's progression in the training stimulus and obviously understanding that at one point you will reach a point where the training stimulus required to keep progressing exceeds what you can recover from that normally comes after 12 weeks so that's when you would go back to more of a maintenance load phase doing let's say one third of the volume you were doing for two or three weeks four weeks and then you start a new training cycle gradually building up again that's the way to progress long term all right, guys, good questions today. I think we had, uh, oh, one more question. Sorry. So my, I, dude, I, I'm so bad with conclusions. I was on a roll. I was doing a great conclusion. Then you come up with the answer, with a question. Anyway, um, is it counterproductive to push your overhead press and bench press in the same phase? Is it on the same day or, or different days? Uh, oh, okay. On the same day. Is it counterproductive to try to PR the deadlift and dash at the same time as well? I would say that. The first or the first question, increasing overhead press and bench press, that's fine. If anything, I find that focusing on the overhead press will get most people's bench press going up. Uh, so, so that's certainly something that I would do. Uh, not necessarily on the same day, because if you really want to focus on the lift, it's probably better to devote a day to that lift and the assistance work for that lift. So let's say you're doing a, a, a push-pull leg split or whatever. You can have one push workout that would be over at press and one that would be bench press. Uh, that is certainly doable. As far as maxing out the deadlift and the squat, I'm not so sure. Uh, because these are so demanding uh, that it's kind of hard to make maximum progress on both. And gains on a deadlift... The, or, doesn't transfer as well to gains in a back squat as the overhead press versus the bench press. Unless you have very long legs, in which case it would be beneficial. But uh, I'm not saying you cannot improve your bench and your squat, but it's hard to focus on both. 
Okay. Uh, so personally, I would only always pick one or, or of the two, and the other one is still trained. It's still, it's still trained, but not with the intent of maximizing performance. If you want to really maximize growth on an exercise, you need to devote more resources to that exercise. How does this split sound? Incline bench press and overhead. Uh, okay, I'm going to assume that's Sunday or Saturday. Let's say Saturday. Saturday, incline bench press and overhead press. Monday pull ups and reverse group, reverse group wrist curl. Why reverse? That's I wouldn't even need to program that. That's, that's so minor of an exercise, you can basically throw it anywhere you want. Rows and French press, rows and curls. Okay, first of all, I think you have rows two days in a row. In fact, three days in a row pull ups, rows, and rows. So Monday, pull-ups, Tuesday, rows, Wednesday, rows. That, that's just not smart. Uh, as I mentioned in the earlier version of the, the early part of this podcast, um, and that's something I changed my opinion on uh, based on scientific studies, is that to have maximum hypertrophy response from a workout, you need to have like 72 hours between hitting the same muscle again, which you don't have because you have 24 hours than 24 hours so you you are very much so getting a lot less out of this next two like the tuesday and wednesday workouts uh thursday close grip bench press and deadlift so you're not training leg there's no squat the deadlift is not a leg exercise it's more of a it's somewhat posterior chain uh well okay is that the only work you do? Do you have assistance exercises? How many sets are you doing? I mean, that, that could be anywhere from bad to extremely bad, depending on, on, on the volume you're doing. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I think that... So if you're, if, you're making, if you're writing wrist curl and French presses in there, that means that that's the only exercise you're doing. Because these are super minor. Again, you, you'd probably need to do many, many sets for that to be effective. It's really not some... I would not do it. I would not recommend it. But again, it might actually work for you. But again, provided that you have a progression model, you are actually using some form of progression. It will work. Uh, but again, you're neglecting many, many different things, in my opinion, especially legs. So, uh, no, I would not recommend that. But, you know... It's your training. You can do whatever you like and what fun to you. All right, guys, that's it for today. Uh, that's my hour's mark. I need to for myself because I have some work to do. Hopefully that was a little bit enjoyable, and I hope to see you next week. So it's always the same time. It's Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Come prepare with your questions. I will be there to answer them. So, guys, until next time, you have a